Hey guys, let me pull this over here. Happy Friday! It's been crazy around here. Um, crazy, crazy, crazy. But I am excited to do a Facebook Live. You were very fortunate to have um, my better half, Gene Howard, last week, and he was showing you how to do lacquer. If you didn't catch that, go back and watch it because he is such a great teacher on lacquer, how to be able to use it, um, spray it. We, I don't know about y'all, but um, we have fly, there have been flies everywhere. We're like going, so Michelle's like getting the fly spray and, fly, and, and spraying it. Um, Make a little circle around. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> maybe you'll kill them. Um, so, I think you're gonna be excited today. I'm gonna show you um, one of my favorite finishes. Um, all of y'all know that I adore milk paint. I adore the finishes that you can get with milk paint. We are getting ready to um, start our Old World Finishing course. So I will put this in a, as a little plug. If you love old finishes, if you love creating finishes, let me show you an example, like this, that are very cracked, very chippy, um, very natural. Here's another one I want to be able to show you. Look at this. If these are finishes that you like to create, even if you want to be able to have something not quite this distressed, but maybe you want it to be able to look more like this. Look at this. Is this fab or what? Um, I'm going to go a little bit into the differences between milk paint and the one-step paint. But part of my goal here is I have a piece of trim that is broken down into sections. And so I wanna be able to, I wanna be able to really help you dissect it visually as well as understand. So, hey Christy, hey Jennifer, hey Pammy. Hey, this is so weird. I'm getting ready to do um, this Facebook Live. I've got all my stuff on my table. Michelle was helping me um, get all this together. Hey Carmelina. And Gene was like, here, I'll come videotape you. And I'm like, um, no, thank you. And he goes, I said, thank you, though. And he was like, why don't, why don't you want people filming you anymore? And I said, here's the deal. When y'all filmed me before, I'm talking, I'm wanting to teach, I'm wanting to make sure that they're learning it. But you know what? I don't get to see your names. I don't get to see the questions. I want to answer the questions when you ask them, if I can. Now, if I'm in the middle of something and I'm in another process, and I will ask this from you. Since this is a tutorial on milk paint, how to be able to create finishes like this that are cracked and chippy and old looking, let's focus on this. So don't ask me, if you would, don't, let's not talk about lacquer today, or let's not talk about gilding. We're going to talk primarily about milk paint. I want you to really understand it. Um, and what this does, this is what we really try to do here at Amy Howard at Home. It adds to your repertoire of finishes. And then as you start to rescue and restore pieces of furniture, you can say, should I do that in a lacquer color? Or should I do that in a lacquer finish? Should I do that in a milk paint? Um, milk paint and the process that I have developed in this, it can be some of the most fabulous finishes you've ever done. Um, hey Linda, hey Rebecca. Um, so let me, um, let me just kind of go through it. I'm gonna explain the differences and I'm gonna talk about, Christy, how you're gonna seal milk paint. And I do wanna use this as far as a question. You always, 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 always have to seal milk paint. You have to seal it because milk paint is, um, it doesn't have the durability, it doesn't have the binding aspects of it in it because we're wanting to be able to manipulate the paint to make it look like this um, and to make it look chippy. If you go to um, antique shops, um, I always tell people, go to the most expensive, when you go out of town, it's really hard right now, so we're gonna be primarily in the US traveling, if, if we go out of town, or a lot of people have gone to Charleston this summer, um, in San Francisco or New York or wherever, but go in the most expensive antique shops there are. Not to buy them, but to be inspired by them. Get really close up with your iPhone or your camera and take a picture. 
start to study and look at those pieces and those finishes and it's going to start training your eyes and you'll start seeing that when you start creating finishes like this. Also you can go on websites called First Dibs. It's just one First Dibs, D-I-B-S. It's a great website to look at Venetian painted furniture, Scandinavian furniture. A lot of the finishes that I want to be able to show you how to do today are actually more Scandinavian. They are more in pale gray colors. They're in the color palette that we have with our Toscana Milk Paint. Um, they're, they're, so, they're softer colors. Now, like for instance, I'm going to show you one here. Like this yellow and this milk paint. When you mix it up, it's going to go a lot darker. But when it dries, this is the color that it's going to dry to. Now, you can also mix milk paint in layers. So, you can have the first coat um, maybe a white color and then you come on top and you do the yellow. Um, spoiler alert and, and those of you that catch me live you get to hear stuff like this. I get in so much trouble afterwards. Um, they'll say, Amy, why are you announcing stuff like that? Like we have a whole meeting, we have a whole campaign. But I'm just going to tell you, spoiler alert, we are in the process. It'll probably be announced August 20th, but we are starting a color of the month club and we are going to be teaching you color theory. We're going to be teaching you what are complementary colors, what colors you put with it, and then we'll be introducing that one color every month that you'll be able to have, and we're going to show you. Um, I'm not going to tell you the first color of the month. You're going to love it. They're definitely trendy colors. They're, they're things that you want to be able to have in your home and, and where they're more on trend. And then we're having um, interior designers that are influencers that are going to be teaching you interior design, how to use these colors, the origination from it, all of that. Because that's what we like to do here. We like to educate you um, about that. So, um, all right, so let's start with um, going over our milk paints. And um, when, now, I won't be able to see some of your questions when I turn this down. Um, you'll, I can't see your questions because I'm wanting you to be able to see my hands. I'm just going to tell you, it's so bad. Look at this. My nails are the worst they've ever been. Um, I've been painting. I've been developing so many new products. Um, I've been in total, total product development mode. Y'all are going to absolutely freak. I can't wait to tell you all of them and show you all of them. They're going to really add to your finishes. A lot of them, there's nothing like it. Um, it's really going to be something very exciting. But here's the bad part. My nails look terrible. So I hate, I thought, I really hate even doing this today for you to see my nails because they're so bad, but um, you just know that I'm working with them. All right, so I'm going to turn this down because I want you to be able to see. So as we are working on milk paint today, it is in layers. Believe it or not, when you're doing a piece, it's going to go very quickly. I'm going to start with raw wood first because, and then I'm going to explain to you why. Now, do you have to always put a milk paint finish on top of raw wood? No, you don't. But you do want to have something that it's going to bind to. So maybe your piece is stained. You can create, um, you can create this finish on a stained finish as well. Um, and I'm going to explain the reason why you do it dark. So I'm going to turn this around. I want to be able to show you. So let's do this. All right, so I've got this um, broken out so that way you can see it in steps. Um, if you've not worked with my gel stains, I'm just going to tell you, they are fantastic. They are water-based. If we had smell-o-vision, you could smell them because they smell amazing and they have a gel-like consistency to them. Part of what, um, when I'm developing product, what I don't like about stains normally is that they are, um, they're, they just drip all over the place. They're really um, thin. Look at this, I want you to see. Look how thick this is. So if you're not part of our before and after group on Facebook, please join and you will see how, um, I've got some diehards. People, when they use this stain, they're like, wait a minute, this smells great. I've never had anything like this. Four, this is a great stain that you can put on top of existing stain, but you can also use it on raw pieces, and that's what I'm doing today. It's really, really thick, um, and you can thin this, you can thin this um, stain and use it as a glaze as well. So if you want to antique something, um, you, can, you can actually thin it down one part water or two parts water, or you can do two parts um, stain versus one part water and make whatever consistency stain you want to be able to go over a color. So maybe you paint a piece of vintage affliction and you want to do a glaze over it, you can very easily use this because this is a water-based stain. All right, 
So this first section here that I've got that it's taped off, I want to be able to just show you. So I'm using my chip brush. Mine are two and a half times the thickness of an average chip brush. You know, I've actually got one first over here that I've already used. I'm going to use this one. And I'm just going to dip it down into my stain. Look at that. See how thick it is? It's really, really thick. It's almost like a glaze-like consistency. And I love it when I'm working on a horizontal surface, I mean a vertical surface. That way um, it doesn't drip as fast. So I'm going to apply this. So I'm working on uh, raw wood. Remember, I've told y'all, Ikea has a lot of great raw, raw wood that you can do these finishes on. Um, you don't always have to start on raw wood. You can, use a, um, you can use an existing stain piece to do the milk paint on, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. But I wanna be able to show you. So y'all might be going, why in the world is she staining that piece if she's getting ready to, to do milk paint? I'm gonna pounce that. Now, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna bring you up for just a second. This is a teacher in me, so I just give up, so no, me too. Woohoo, colored my, okay. <laughs> I have to see what y'all are saying. All right, why would I stain this first? Somebody tell me. Why, if I'm doing milk paint and it's all about a layering process, why would I stain it first? Somebody tell me. Let's answer. This is part of learning. Y'all learn from from each other, why would we stain it first if we're gonna put paint on it? Come on. I, see, I know I've got some of my old world finishing people that watch this. I want you to answer that. Why would I stain it first? I'm gonna turn this around just a little bit because I want you to be able to see this end that I've got. I am literally just kind of coming in with my lint-free rag and I am wiping it off. Let me turn this down. Somebody tell me. Why am I staining this first? Why would I go to the trouble of putting stain on to raw wood before I'm actually gonna do the milk paint? Come on, guys. To see the color when you bring it off, that's right. Good job, Natalie. Yes, 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 we're layering. So. Let me get you a piece that's already been done. Let's look at this. Let's dissect this for a minute. So see how this has been chipped off? I'll just be honest with you how I did this. The first thing I did was I stained it. The second thing that I did, the second step after my staining is gonna be my cracked gesso. Cracked gesso is not used with one step. It's not used with any other thing but milk paint. Cracked gesso. So I'm gonna show you in just a minute. This is what it looks like right here. There is, I'm gonna tell you, there's not another product like it on the market. You're not gonna find it at another company. Don't, don't, don't uh, spend your time trying to research it or whatever. I'm the one that developed this. So you can't use other um, materials if you wanna be able to go in and um, crack your milk paint like this and have it to where it will pop off. It will give you a fissure. Um, the more you want the paint to pop off, the more of the gesso I'm gonna put on. I'm gonna show you that in just a minute. But the whole reason why we're doing the stain first is because when we come back and antique this and we pull it through, we want the stain to show through. So it's a layering effect. If you think about this, the whole point with furniture, because there weren't, there weren't major furniture manufacturers hundreds of years ago, guys. People would move from country to country, and if it was too far and it was going to be too much trouble because they didn't, um, uh, they didn't have trucks and automobiles, you know, to be able to put their stuff in, they would sell it, and then, um, or they would buy from somebody else and they would paint it. So part of the beauty of those antiques, especially like these Scandinavian pieces, um, Venetian pieces. Uh, with, that are Italian derivatives, they would have layer upon layer, and then as they started to wear and chip, you would see maybe at one time the furniture, make it, furniture maker, originally they stained it. Well, the next person that bought it, they wanted it a color, and the next person that bought it, they wanted it another color. Because, the, and the paints that they were working with, they were all caseins, which is what? It's milk paint. 
they were natural properties. They were either from caseins and gouaches, gessos, rabbit skin glues. They were all from animals, they were all from plants, and they were natural, and they didn't have the binding in it that they needed. So when you see these great looking antiques, that's why you see multiple layers. And this is what I love. It's what I love creating. And you can do it to different degrees. If you don't want it to where there's a lot of different color, you can do it more like this. So where it's softer, but it still has that beautiful kind of Scandinavian look to it. So that first stain can either be one that I can apply to a raw piece, or it can be on an existing piece of furniture that I can add it to. So now let's go to the second step. So I'm gonna turn this around. So the next step that we have here, this is my stain, it has dried. When you're working with our gel stain, um, you're looking at about um, an hour for it to dry, depending on, too, about how thick you put it on. So I'm going to move that over to the side. So now, what's the next step for this? What did we just talk about? The next step, if I want to have a fissure vein, if I want to be able to have it to where it's cracking, even if it's where it's just a little bit, if I want to have some texture to it, I'm going to need to add cracked gesso. All right, so I'm going to take my cracked gesso. It always comes in a powder form like this because it does have a shelf life to it. Um, it's going to have a shelf life to where it's going to be up, it's going to be good up to two weeks. All right, so I'm going to take a little bit of this cracked gesso. I'm going to put it in here. I've got some made up, but I actually, I want you to be able to see the process that it's actually done. All right, so I'm going to put two things of cracked gesso and um, I'm going to put some water in it. Now, as a rule, I'll tell people, do warm water don't do real cold water because it's gonna blend better. So I'm gonna, um, this is kind of more lukewarm water. Now, the thinner you make this, the finer your crack. The thicker you make it, the more it's gonna have a tendency to pop off. So if you've got a client that you're painting a piece of furniture for and they're like, um, I want it to look like this. I want it to be really cracked. I want, it to, I want, the, I want the paint to pop off then you're gonna probably put it on just a little bit thicker. So let me just kind of show you. Stirring it up. Now, here's another tip. I'll put in less water. I always put the, the gesso in first. And again, I'm the only company that has this because I developed the process. Part of working in my time in um, Italy in a bodega. So I will mix it um, thicker. Then after I've kind of mixed the gesso together, then I'll come back and I'll add more water. Don't put it too much at first. I'll, I usually let it be kind of thick and then I'll thin it down. Now, the other thing is some people will use blenders. Here's the problem with blenders. Let me turn this up because I can't see your questions. Here's the problem with, um, yes, answer your question. You can use a hair dryer and make it dry a little bit faster. I do it all the time. Matter of fact, I've got one sitting up here on my desk. So I just hit it like that. Um, so the only problem is if you stick this in a blender, and it's okay to do that, um, a lot of times people will do those immersion blenders, um, then what's gonna happen is it's gonna create a lot of foam. You don't wanna paint with foam. Um, by the way, if, you, um, if you're catching me, uh, please tell me where you're from. Um, um, and if you are not part of the before and after group with Amy Howard at home, please join it. It's a beautiful community of people that are rescuing and restoring the over 30 million tons of furniture that we're throwing away in this country every year. And we need to be rescuing and restoring them. But what happens after you use the one-step paint, you see how easy it is to use. Then you want to go, you want to raise your level of connoisseurship, and you want to learn more. That's what I'm teaching you today. I'm wanting to be able to show you how you can create these beautiful, chippy, fabulous finishes. Um, that are so, so easy. All right, so let me turn this down again. All right, so what we did first, we did our stain, it's dried. So here's the next step, that's dried. Now what am I gonna do? I'm gonna apply my cracked gesso. The only thing that you use cracked gesso on, guys, is your milk paint. You do not use it with one step. So here it is. And you can make it the night before. I would probably recommend making it the night before and letting it sit. That way everything is nice and dissolved so that way you don't have um, particles in it that aren't really mixed up really well. And this is how we're gonna apply it. Just pound that down. 
bouncing this in here like this. So if you've got crevices like this where it's carved, you do want to just kind of pounce it. I'll move this down so that way you can see a little better. You want to pounce it. I do recommend, especially when you're working with milk paints and your gessos, to work on a flat surface. So if you have drawers, if you have doors that you're working on, you need to lay them down flat because it's going to be too difficult to work with. Now, the other thing you want to make sure, if you're pouncing it like this to get it down in all the crevices, don't leave it like this. You need to come back and you need to smooth it out. You can pounce it a little bit and then smooth it out like this. You just want to make sure that you don't have too many puddles. Make it a little bit softer. Get it down in the crevices. Can you hear them pound? They're, they're hammering away in the back. Mixing paint, putting those tops on it. All right. So, so what was our first step? We, we stained it. I did this on raw wood. If you have an existing piece, then you do want to make sure that you clean it really good with the clean slate. Um, and then you can come back and you can put your binder on. I mean your um, crack gesso. So this is the crack gesso. I mixed it up. I usually do it one part water to one part crack gesso. A, um, a size, uh, one bag of crack gesso will easily do a large dresser. If you're going to be doing several pieces of furniture, I would recommend probably getting at least two bags of crack gesso. All right. So. Now this is gonna dry. I've got a hair dryer here. I could very easily um, hit this if I wanna speed up the process, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna go to the next step as part of why I have this prepared. One, two, now this is dry. Look at the difference. Look at the difference of how it looks when it's wet. Is everybody with me? And this is what it looks like when it's dry. It's gonna go from white to just kind of a cloudy color. Now. Make sure your stain is completely dry before you go to the step because if you don't, then it's going to make your crack gesso look like it's too brown. There again, if you're working with a piece that's already stained, just clean it well with a clean slate and then uh, put your crack gesso on top of it. So, all right, I am going to sand this because feeling this, it's rough. Um, and look what's also going to happen when I sand it. I'm working with 400 grit sandpaper. Now, I'm not wanting to distress it. The whole point of what I'm doing with just kind of sanding this is I wanna make it smooth and I wanna get out my brush marks out of it. Some of it, you may pull some of it off and that's okay. The other cool thing about it is, not only is this gesso going to crack your finish, crack your milk paint, it is also going to give you that gorgeous white that's underneath most antique pieces. So let me show you. See like on this piece? So I stained it first. I did uh, the cracked gesso. Can you see this where it's just like popping off? Can you see that? That The cracked gesso will allow you to be able to do that. And I just love that. It can really make a piece look very, very authentic. If you don't want that and you want it to look more like this, then don't put on so much gesso. Um, you can go, um, you can go a lot lighter. Now, don't forget, dust it off. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna dust off. I want to get any residue from my 400 grit sandpaper off of here. Now, let me check for your questions. All right. Okay. Let me see. Hold on just a second. Um, let me see. I have a large armoire. I would like to use the gesso, but there is not a way to lay it down flat. Let me think about that. If I had, yes, you take the doors off. Yes, um, armoires are going to be harder, but yes, I have done them before. I, I used to do a lot of armoires in the past, and um, I would take the doors off, and I would lay the doors down. I would take the drawers out, sometimes if it has drawers on the bottom, and you can lay that armoire down on its side. Now, if it's an armoire with bookcases, um, take the doors off, work on those, and then just take your time on the sides. So it can be done. Um, the main problem is what I don't want you to do, if you mix up your milk paint too thick where it doesn't drip, then you're gonna have it to where it's harder for you to be able to antique it. A lot of people make this mistake. Please, 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 if you don't learn anything today, please, please, please remember this. 
don't mix your milk paint the consistency like the one step paint is. You want to mix, it's thin. It's one part water and one part powder of the milk paint. A lot of people will say, Amy, what's the difference? And y'all have heard me say this. I sound like a broken record, but at least I'm consistent. A lot of the reason why, um, I'm like, should I take y'all in the back? We'll see. Um, we ship in our, um, our pigments from Provence. We, they come from quarries. They're all natural. They're not synthetic colors. So if any of y'all have ever gone to Florence and you go into Mr. Zecchi's shop, there's a little shop, it's a little art studio in Florence, and his name is Mr. Zecchi. And it's been there for 600 years. So you think about all the famous artists, um, painting the Sistine Chapel, all of them, they went into Mr. Zecchi's and they would point and they would get that pigment. And that pigment was mixed together um, with eggs and temperas and things to be able to make the paints that they were using and creating in those beautiful murals and those beautiful paintings that are existing now in, um, in museums everywhere. So those same quarries, those same pigments, I fly them in here from Provence. That's why it takes weeks and months for me to get them. And then we make our milk paints ourselves. And so I tell you what, you know what? Hang with me. Um, I know there's some people on Facebook, they'll go, um, she talks too much, or she just needs to get to the point. My point in being a teacher, part of the whole reason why I do this, is I want you to learn something. I want you to feel like I added value to what you were learning and your finishes. So I'm bringing you in the back for just a second. Um, and I want to show you something. I'm going to show you, we make our milk paints ourselves. And I know our bags came in. Um, they're these huge bags that we ship. Here we go. I'm going to show you. Are y'all with me? Hopefully you're learning something. Hopefully you're going, wow, that's really cool that y'all do that. I'm going to turn this around and I want to be able to show you as far as, so these are colorants. These, these are literally like the kilos. You see a lot of these um, made in France and they, we buy them in these huge bags. And then um, we actually have a gal, her name is Teresa. She's been with us um, about 11 years and I have taught her the processes as far as making these. And let me show you, these are just pure pigments. Now we'll tell you, pigments, pigments that are true pigments, pigments that come from um, these quarries, they're horribly expensive, horribly expensive. Like that's why, like when you would go in Mr. Zecchi's, sometimes a little bit of a um, container of like, you buy them by the pound. And sometimes they'd run upwards of $300, $400, $500 a pound. So just a little bit of pigment um, is what is used to, to make beautiful paints. But so many of the paints that you see now, they're just synthetic. They're, there's nothing, there's not beautiful um, natural pigment paints. So these milk paints are done that way. So let me turn this around. All right, so look at this. So these are our pigments. Look at this. So this is how we store them. Look at this. Isn't that absolutely glorious? So when we bring them in here, we, we've got these Tupperware containers, and this is the actual natural pigment that we use. So like, we have a color, it's called Toulouse Rose. Um, that's the color of the actual pigment, that, that color. So we can mix them. Which one is this one? This is more um, of a brown. This is a, um, the Lore Earth. Look at that. Here's, here's one of the pigments. Look at this. Does that, that just makes my heart sing. That is um, actually what we make our Riviera blue with. Here's our, look at this. This is our Venetian green pigment. So, I'll show you one more. This is our um, Scandinavian gray. So that's one of, that is one of my, one of my favorite colors. So, um, I know y'all are like, she's crazy. No, my whole point, I thought, if I can teach you, um, one, how special it is, and then um, when we are putting, we put the product together, we, we hand make, we hand make our milk paints, and, oh, I'm going to show you this too. So, we're getting ready to launch our Old World Finishing course, 
and you get a bundle when if you become part of the overall finishing course and there's a bundle in it and I take you through all these modules these are all getting packed up um, for when that will be released so um, <laughs> I need to see your name you think crazy is a compliment I and I do I uh, um, I'm one of those people oh hold on I want you to see this can you say hi Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Has my bride been showing you the wonderful attributes of Toscana milk paint? It's I have. her favorite finish. <laughs> um, I showed them how we have big bags of them back there, and I talked to them about Teresa. I opened them up, and I let them see the colors. I told them about Mr. Zeki. It's a messy Zeki. <laughs> it's a Mr. Zeki. So, um, anyway. So, just what really sets it apart, because... Not all milk paints are the same because a lot of companies, they don't want to go through the trouble. They don't want to go through the expense that we do. But here's, here's one of the major differences as far as our, um, our getting those pigments and doing them is because when you start to antique them and when you mix them, it's like one color can have the variances of like three or four colors. So if you have a gray, it can almost look like back in my stand, it can look like three different grays when you go back in and antique it. That's why. I, those of you who know me and that I've done this um, my whole adult life as far as finishes, if it's not done in, a, in just a really beautiful form and done with excellence, I really I'm not going to do it. So um, this is uh, this is one of the grays, one of the grays that I showed you back there. Now here's what's crazy, guys. This is one color. But when you antique it, it can look like three different values of gray. But that's all because of the pigment, the quality of the pigment and the way that it's used. All right, so let's get back. So sorry, took you off on a little adventure. Um, so, and please, if, if this is something you know, somebody that loves doing finishes, if they've gotten into this, share this video and show them and um, let's spread the love. And it, it helps me when I do these tutorials, I feel like I'm really reaching an audience of people that will appreciate it, as well as um, be able to rescue the furniture instead of throwing it away. All right, so I'm gonna turn this around. So let's go over this again. So now we, we lightly sanded that down. So we, we stained it, we put on our cracked gesso, we've lightly sanded it down. So now it's ready for the paint. Now, can you mix paints? 100%. So this is my Scandinavian gray. And I'll lift this up just a little bit. This is my Scandinavian gray. And then I'm going to mix a little bit of black with this. Okay? So, sorry. There, there are advantages and disadvantages to um, doing this without a cameraman. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit in here. Remember again, when you're mixing your paint, it's one part one part um, paint, one part water. Do not make your paint too thick, guys, because you know what's gonna happen? When people go, I, I can't pull the paint off. It's not antiquing, it's not cracking, it's not, it's because you have put too, it's too thick. Do not try to mix your paint to be, um, don't try to mix your paint to be the same thickness of a one-step paint. It's one part water, one part paint. Now look what I'm doing. Can you mix them? Absolutely, I can. So um, I tell people to get little notebooks and you can measure these. You can say um, a teaspoon of this, a quarter a teaspoon of this, and you can mix your own colors and they do beautifully. I love mixing colors. So I added just a little bit of black to the Scandinavian gray. I wanted to deepen it just a little bit. Maybe I'll add just a little bit more. But if I was doing this for um, a client, I would actually measure it. I don't want it to go too dark. And here's the other fun thing, because these are natural pigments like this, you can mix it dry. Remember, this is what it's gonna dry down to when it's, when it's a dry pigment like this. When you add your water, it's gonna go dark. When it's wet, it's gonna be darker. But when it dries down, it's gonna be this color again. When you come back with milk paints and you start putting waxes and things on, it is gonna go darker again. All right, so what do we wanna do? We're gonna take just regular tap water I normally will put just a little bit of water first. I mix it thick 
like this, just in, in a paste form, just like I showed you like I do with the gesso. Mix it up. That way I can kind of press it in just a little bit like this. You know, you can also use um, milk paint, which these are like casings. You can use these um, if a lot of you are artists that you like doing um, paintings, like canvas paintings. It's beautiful to use on that as well. Now, see how thick that is? Now, I'm just doing that so it allows me to be able to get it really mixed up well. But I'm not going to paint with this. This I would not be able to antique with it. So now I'm going to come back. I usually like doing with warm water because we want to do one part paint, milk paint, one part in the powder, and one part water. So this is where you're going to struggle. You're going to go, I can't paint with that. It's going to drip all over the place. Now, let me talk to you for just a second. You can get used to it. You're going to see it's going to go on thinner, but it's going to dry down opaque and you're going to love it when it dries. And then you're going to love it even more when you're starting to antique it. You cannot antique one step paint to look like this. If you want to be able to have paint to where it's chipped off, to where it's pulled off, this is the part to where I become a finished snob. It's okay. I need a button. I'm a finished snob because you cannot make things look authentic and worn and look like they are hundreds of years old with this. People think that they can paint something opaque and cover it and come back and wear it around the edges. You, it's not going to look authentic. It's not going to look, it's somewhat offensive. It, it sometimes, it, um, it doesn't look like the real McCoy. I want to teach you to do it and create it in such a way that you are really proud of it and that it looks like it has a pedigree, that it's been around for a long, long time. All right, and it's not that hard either. And you know the other great thing about all these products that I'm showing you today, they have no VOCs. There are no volatile organic compounds that are chemicals. I mean, you don't have to worry about it. Literally, it's like shopping in the produce area. They're natural. I am asthmatic. It doesn't make me cough. Um, it's really, really easy to work with. All right, so now let's go to the next step. So I've got it to where I've mixed that up. My paint is thin. I had some, I think, that was mixed up before we went live right here. Here's the part that you're going to have to get used to when you're working with mill paints. It is going to separate. Look at this. See, we made this like 45 minutes ago. See how the paint, look how thick that is. That's yummy, wonderful pigment that you need. Every time when you're working on it, you're going to need to just kind of agitate it. You wouldn't work with a small mouth jar like this. You're going to work with something larger. But you do want to make sure that every time you stick your brush in there, just agitate it a little bit so it, it's um, stirred together because it doesn't have the chemicals in it to make it to where um, it won't separate. Now, sometimes, sometimes people ask me, what's the lifetime of this? Your milk paint, once you mix it up like this, put a container, you know, put a lid on it, um, and it's going to be good for at least um, a week and a half to two weeks. I tell people, put it in the refrigerator, but when you get ready to paint with it again, take it out of the refrigerator and let it come back to its natural, just room temperature, okay? Don't paint with cold paint out of the refrigerator, and I've got to look at you when I tell you this. Don't microwave it. Don't take your paint out of the microwave, out of the refrigerator and micro... I had somebody that did that. They were like, Amy told me to not paint with cold paint. I took it out of the refrigerator, so I just microwaved it to warm it up. Please don't microwave it. Just set it out. It'll come back to room temperature within an hour. Okay? All right. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, Christy, thank you. It's like making a finished off, too. Not meaning a finished off. We've got to help, God, help me guys think of a better way. But y'all know what I'm saying. It's just like our level of connoisseurship kind of comes up here. Discernment. Maybe is that a better word? We're more discerning. Um, we're more selective. Maybe that's a better word. Snob just sounds bad. Anyway, all right, so here we go. Um, thank you for hanging with me. All right, so my crack gesso has dried. The whole point of the crack gesso is because I want it to crack. I want it to allow my paint to pop off. I'm going to brush on my milk paint like this. I'm pouncing it, but I always want to come back and kind of feather it in. See, look at the coverage. That's why when you're working with milk paint, guys, you're going to have to lay it flat. It's too thin. Um, it's really going to be too thin for you to be able to work on a vertical surface. 
look at that. The coverage is great. Now, I love that I've got this right beside I'm going to have to decline them. Okay. Now, can you see this? Look at this. Can you see the difference? This side is wet. This side is dry. Same color. See how when it goes, when it's wet, when you're working with it, but how it's going to dry down. So the same way, always remember, it's going to dry down to be the same color as it is when it's dry in the container. That'll really help you on colors. You're going to have the best time. I want you to play around with mixing, um, with mixing colors as well. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my antiquing glaze. And if you buy this in one of our stores, um, the majority of them now, they covered it up. Um, this one, because that's why maybe I've got it in here as a sample. There's a QR code on these now. And basically, you can go in and you can take your iPhone and you can hover over this and it will play the video that goes along with the product. That will be really helpful. Um, we have that on all those products now. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take my antiquing glaze. I'm just going to pour a little bit in here. And when I'm doing this, I also want to be able to have a container of water. And this is my, uh, this is my bath. So I'm also going to have a seawall sponge. I usually cut these up. So they come pretty big. You can get them on Amazon, but I'll cut them up so they're small. I do the same thing with my sandpaper. Um, but I immerse this in water. Before you do, this one's, see how firm it is? See how hard it is? You want to immerse it into water because you want it really soft, but they're going to have to, I wish they stopped. Okay. So this is Jean's phone, by the way. Um, all right. So I immerse it into water. So now I'm going to immerse it into my antiquing glaze. Now, before I do that, you know what? I thought I want to show you a little trick. So I'm going to take my chip brush. I'm going to dip it into my antiquing glaze. I'm going to offload just a little bit. Please, if you're popping on, I am showing you how to do one of my favorite finishes today, milk paint. Um, and I'm taking you kind of through the process as far as from staining it to cracked gesso to painting it um, and now into the an actual um, antiquing process. So I'm going to fly spec this just a little bit. So I'm going to take my fingers from the base of this and I'm going to pull it up. So that way it's going to fleck it on here just a little bit like this. Look at this. Can you see that? Should I get that just a little closer? Can you see? Can you see the flecks? Give me a yeah. You can see the flecks, Amy. All right. So I want you to be able to see the flecks. So I'm going to let that set for just a minute. See the flex? This kind of looks like um, it will show up. When you come to antique it, when you're going to getting ready to cover the whole thing, you're going to go, they go away, I don't see it. Guess what? When it dries down, you will actually see that. I promise. It's part of the whole process. Okay, so I've got my antiquing glaze. I've immersed my sponge in it. I'm going to squeeze it out so where it's wet, but it's not dripping all over the place. And now I'm going to go in, you see, I'm going to go in and I'm going to start pulling this. Now, this is why when I talk about antiquing and when you want to make something look authentic, sandpaper, guys, is not going to do it. This will do it. And it's so fun. It's so easy. Look at this. Can you all see this? It's so hard for me to be able to see you and see what I'm doing. Can you see that? Can you see what's happening? Look at that. Do you see it? Look at that. It's like it's worn over a period of time, how it's actually just kind of faded away. There's no sandpaper marks, but it's natural. The cool thing about it is it's so easy. Look, so I'm, I'm just pulling it. Now, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have a lint-free rag like this, and I'll kind of pop it, because what I want to do is I want to see how it's starting to wear that away, so that way I can see it. Is that helping? So here it is before, there's where I painted it. See where it's solid? And if you want to be able to antique it, now we're in the antiquing process, and, and the antiquing glaze is starting to release that to where it looks totally yummy. I'm going to antique this just a little bit more. I want you to be able to see it. 
So like if you have a client, they're like, I want it really, I hardly want to see any of it. Let me turn this around. I want, I want a lot of color. Here's the cool thing is, I could have put maybe like a yellow under this. I could have done a little bit of rose or another color so that way it will be, you know, showing through. And the reason for the rag, it allows me to just kind of press into it and dry it off and, and it'll allow me to be able to see some of the gesso. Now, I need to hit this with a hair dryer um, and I'm wondering I, if I wanted this to crack more, I could put I could have put a little bit more cracked gesso on it. You don't want to do too much cracked gesso, and don't do more than one coat. If you want to, just do just do one coat and do it just a little bit thicker. So I need to get down in the crevices of this just a little bit. But I'm always using my sponge, having the best time. This is gonna look so pretty, and I promise I'll finish it out so that way y'all can see it. When you're working on a piece, you're gonna get more wear, of course, on the edges. You're not gonna get as much wear down in here, so you don't wanna go kinda of crazy in there, but, and I'll leave my antiquing glaze in there because it does have a color to it. It does, um, it does give it some variance um, and some, it makes it really, really pretty. All right, so you know what I'm gonna to have to do? I'm gonna to have to dry this really quickly. Hold on, let me see. Hey ma'am, can you see if, I, if I'm plugged in? Let me, um, somebody walked by to go to the bathroom and like I'm grabbing them. Um, okay, hold on, we've got a hair dryer. Let's dry this just a little bit. Your phone's gonna probably die. How many colors does milk have come in? You know, we have, um, we have about 14 colors, but we've been working on um, more. And I'm actually working on a booklet to show you how to make hundreds of colors with what we have because you can take uh, just our Scandinavian gray and add a little bit of the black to it and make a, another gray, mix the blues and the grays together. Um, it's so much fun and then that way you have your own color. Alright, it's fun and you have stopped watching everyone else. I love you. How sweet. Thank you for the encouragement. Um, I love what I love what I do so much, guys. I really do. But what gives me some more satisfaction, too, is knowing that y'all are just like me. You love doing it, too. And, um, you know, and I will say I'm very blessed because I have a husband who um, encourages me. And um, he likes my excitement. He, um, he enjoys it just as much as I do. And he's a great teacher. I'll just, it was so funny today. He was like, are you able to do Facebook Live? And I was like, I really want to. I want to show them um, the, the step outs like I'm doing today as far as stain, gesso, sanding the gesso, applying the milk paint, antiquing it. I want to take them through the process to where they can see it. Um, and he said, well, if you don't have time, I'm happy to do it. And I'm like, you like it. He likes doing it, so um, I'll have to let him teach again because he is a fantastic teacher. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to have to wrap this up before my phone dies, I'm going to be using um, some light antique wax. Now, I love this, but I'm going to tell you, I love my Jerome Beast wax, but what I'm doing to Scana, I use pucks. Um, and let me tell you why. This is a combination. Look, at, Can you see the color? What's that color from? Somebody tell me. Um, I'll just tell you for the sake of time. It's beeswax. So it's a combination of carnauba wax and beeswax. And it smells divine. Now, does it, yeah, it's, it, ha, it is a petroleum base. We're not in the food base world anymore. This is a petroleum base because I have to put something in it to make the beeswax spreadable. But it has a little bit of the color in it. And this is really much prettier when you're working with Toscana. All right, so I'm going to turn this around again. I want you to see. Please, 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 please tell me where you're from and, um, and where you're watching from. And when I check Facebook later, I'll be answering your questions. All right, so I'm going to take my chip brush again. I'm loading it up with the light antique wax, and I'm offloading it. Now, usually I have a little cardboard that I do this with. And as I'm doing this in this section, look, I'm going to kind of hit it on the tops just a little bit. 
you're gonna see, that's why you don't need to antique it too much, because you're gonna notice the, de the definition and how this is done is gonna show up a lot more. You wanna be careful. Like I almost wore too much off. It just depends. Um, sometimes I like it to where there's a lot, um, but this is pretty worn now. You wouldn't wanna do the entire piece like this. You wanna be really careful. Um, unless you wanna be able to have it like this, and this, I added a lot of um, cracked gesso to it to make the paint actually pop off. All right, so now once this comes to tack, I'm gonna add my dark wax. Now, please, you cannot add this dark wax until this is, has come to tack. If you add this before when it's still wet and greasy, you're just gonna create two waxes. If you wanna be able to add dust of ages to get down in the crevices, which can be really pretty, um, you want to you want to do it before it's completely dry, probably about 90% dry. So I'm going to load up my dark wax. Here's the other thing: don't ever use this by itself first. You always use this light antique wax, and then you use the dark wax. They go together. They're Amy and Jean. They're married forever. But you always have to use this first, and then you're going to use this only about 10 to 15%. That's the fastest way that a lot of people ruin a project, guys. It's because they put on too much dark wax. The dark wax is just intended to give you a little bit of depth, to come around the edges, to be able to give some highlight and some depth, okay? And I can play that with that just a little bit more. But I think it gives you an idea of what we're going for. So I stained my piece first. Uh, and if you, you, you're working on an existing piece, clean it with a clean slate, and then you can come back with your cracked gesso. I applied my cracked gesso, then you're gonna need to sand it. You always need to sand the cracked gesso because it's gonna be really rough. Then I mixed and I applied my, my milk paint. This is a solid application of milk paint, and then if you wanted to antique it, I came back and I used my antiquing glaze and I antiqued it. And then I'll come back and do it with my light wax and my dark wax. So hopefully, you understand how to do milk paint now. It's, it's really, really easy. It's easy to mix these colors. I want you to know that, um, I'll just show you close up with this. As far as creating finishes like this, it's all gonna be determined on the quality and the kind of products that you use. Now, I'm gonna say something, and I don't mean this ugly, but the majority of retailers out there one, they don't carry products like this because it requires explanation. And most people, when they walk up, the salespeople aren't gonna understand what to tell you. They're not gonna be able to know the, and understand the idiosyncrasies. And they might not even understand finishes like this. That's why I take the time to be able to go through and explain to you what each one does, how they can go together, and how you can truly transform the furniture that you're painting. So share this video it's going to be up on youtube we'll be sending it out later um on if you're not if you're not on our email list you can sign up for that and um stay on this journey with me it's a lot of fun um, my tagline is crafting a beautiful life creating beautiful finishes with a lot of depth and a lot of character can be incredibly rewarding and if you want to build a finishing business um, the old world finishing course that you'll be hearing about this week it's for you. I have a group that I mentor, that um, we, I mentor them through the business building process and doing the finishes, but you'll be hearing more about that this week. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, it's a joy for me to take this time out to be able to share with you why we are so passionate about what we do here at Amy Howard at Home. And my favorite finish, my favorite product is our milk paints, our cracked gesso, our antiquing glaze. Have a fantastic Friday, everybody. Um, stay safe, wear your mask, but guess what? We can still go to estate sales tomorrow. See you there. Bye-bye.